University. My name is Jenna Skinner, and I will be moderating the session today. The speaker is Aaron Enriquez, who is the operations manager at the Pacific Primate Sanctuary. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that this session will be recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, then you may turn off your camera at this time. Additionally, to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, I'm going to request that we all follow a few session rules. One mic, one voice, only one person speaks at a time. Respect all identities. This includes pronouns, nationalities, ethnic groups, etc. This is a safe place. Don't feel discouraged. All are welcome to engage and ask questions. One question only out of respect for others and time. Please stick to just asking one question. Only speak for yourself and no one else. No name calling or derogatory comments, questions of any kind. Failure to comply will result in your termination from the session. And keep the chat clear of traffic. Only use it to propose questions. Uh, we will be answering questions after the presentation. So if you'd like to drop a question in the chat, I will make sure that is answered following the presentation. And our session runs until 430 today. Now I will go ahead and introduce our speaker. Aaron Enriquez is the operations manager of the Pacific Primate Sanctuary. The Pacific Primate Sanctuary is a volunteer based nonprofit wildlife conservation organization dedicated to the protection, preservation, and permanent care of threatened, endangered, and distressed primates. Since 1984, the sanctuary has been maintained a federally authorized facility for New World monkeys, many of whom have been rescued from research laboratories, the exotic pet trade, and tourist attractions. At primate, Pacific Primate Sanctuary, the needs of the primates are first and foremost. Each primate receives the best care possible for his or hers physical, psychological, and social well-being. The monkeys are treated with, with respect, compassion, and empathy. They are provided the housing, social grouping, nutrition, and care that best benefit and facilitate their innate natural behavior. Pacific Primate Sanctuary provides refuge and rehabilitation, creating naturalistic habitats where primates have recovered from the trauma and abuse they suffered. The monkeys are nurtured with dedicated care and provided an abundance of organically grown food and forage in an ideal subtropical climate. All right, go ahead, Erin, whenever you're ready. Uh, aloha, and um, wanted to thank the virtual, the creators of this conference for inviting us to participate. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Erin, and I am honored to be here presenting um, representing Pacific Primate Sanctuary and to have the opportunity to share our work with you. Um, Pacific Primate Sanctuary or PPS, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was founded in 1984. Our mission is the protection, preservation, and permanent care of threatened, endangered, and distressed primates. Um, for over 35 years, we have maintained a federally authorized facility for New World monkeys, and we've given refuge to animals from research laboratories, the exotic pet trade, um, tourist attractions, ones that have been confiscated from smugglers, um, really a broad range of animals. Currently, 60% of the world's primate population is threatened with extinction, and 75% of all primate um, populations are declining globally. The, um, the main reason for this decrease is, of course, human activities um, and habitat loss because of that. There's deforestation for agriculture, um, building of new roads, logging, and another major issue is just the exploitation of animal species throughout the world. Um, for example, cotton top tamarins, that's one of the species we care for. They are critically endangered. And um, back in the 60s and 70s, 30,000 were taken from the wild for biomedical research. So this just really highlights why it's so important that primate sanctuaries and conservation organizations exist. Pacific Primate Sanctuary, we've been around for 35 years and we provide safe refuge for to threatened animals. Some of them are critically endangered, some are threatened, and some have just come from very difficult, challenging backgrounds. Um, the sanctuary is really grounded in the belief that all beings are equally sacred. We've, for 
the time that we've been um, rescuing animals, we've really learned how to nurture and care for primates. We've seen traumatized animals um, slowly heal and become whole again through our rehabilitation efforts. They come from research laboratories for where for generations they've never seen the outside world and they go outside and it's just evokes wonder and joy and animals you know from tourist attractions or expats they regain some of their birthright at the sanctuary they're able to move freely through the greenery feel the rain and the sun on their bodies and the wind on their fur um, our volunteers grow food organically you can see from the pictures here that we are in a tropical location and we've got um, we're able to grow plants for the enclosures and fresh fruit and fresh vegetables the for the animals right there on site um, and they're similar to what they would find in their native rainforests this work it's the work of the heart um, i've been a volunteer at the sanctuary for 13 years and it's been you know really something that i'm very passionate about and we are a volunteer-based organization it's our intent that the monkeys will never be exploited again, which is why we have a non visitation policy. Um, one of our guiding principles is, is it good for the monkeys? We ask this question a lot. We try to see everything through the monkeys eyes and from their perspective. Um, most of the monkeys that we care for are very, very small. Um, they're highly susceptible to illnesses from humans and, um, a lot of them come from very difficult pasts. So from their view, having visitors, having strangers come, it's it's distressing, it's alarming, and it's it's dangerous. So our community, the sanctuary community has really come to understand that not having them on exhibit is really necessary in order to provide sanctuary, to provide a peaceful, safe environment. I'm gonna share this video, it's about five minutes long, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the things that um, I think make the sanctuary really unique.
So kind of a a brief overview of, of what the sanctuary is and some video footage of some of the animals that we've rescued and in our care. Um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the, the specifics of who we care for. Um, the sanctuary specifically cares for New World monkeys. Um, uh, platyrines are New World monkeys, primates that live in Mexico, Central and South America. The families in New World primates are the Calatricidae, Cibidae, Aotidae, Pithicidae, and Atelidae. In particular, we um, care for Calatricids, Cibids, and Atelids, mostly Calatricids. We are primarily a marmoset and tamarind sanctuary, but we do have, as you saw, some capuchins and spider monkeys. Um, uh, platyrine means flat nose. New World monkeys. Uh, tend to have broad, flat noses, which is a distinguishing characteristic. Um, several New World monkeys also have prehensile or semi-prehensile tails, which is something that is exclusive to New World monkeys. And um, they tend to be mid to small sized primates, um, as opposed to the Old World monkeys, which where you get some of the larger primates. But like I said, in particular, we care for um, Calatrickets. So we have um, black tufted eared marmosets, cotton top tamarins, white tufted eared marmosets. Um, we also have had weeds marmosets. We have uh, saddleback tamarins. And in the past, we've cared for other species of calatrickets as well, including golden handed tamarins, pygmy marmosets. Calatrickets are mostly known for their small size. They are um, some of the smallest monkey species in the world. Um, most of the monkeys in our care are three to 500 grams. And caring for really small animals is different from caring than caring for large animals. And that's one of the reasons that we kind of specialize in New World primates is it allows us to really customize care to get to know the individual species that we're caring for and provide really custom care for each of them. Um, some other things that are really unique about calatrickids is they have um, extended family groups with pair bonded um, mother and father, and then the rest of the family helps to rear the offspring. They also are gummivorous, um, especially marmosets are actually able to extract gum from trees. So really kind of unique primate species. Um, we also care for some white-faced capuchins. These are a little bit larger. They're a mid-sized primate. They are known for being highly intelligent. They're extractive foragers. They live in polygamous groups and tend to live in large troops. And we also have a pair of black-handed spider monkeys, um, Carlos and Montana. They were given refuge from um, tourist attractions. They spent 20 years in tourist attractions here on Maui. They are one of the larger New World primate species. They are ripe fruit specialists, so they have a unique diet. And uh, they live in what's known as a fission fusion society, which is another kind of unique uh, social grouping for primates. Um, and they uh, brachiate. That's one of their, their movements is brachiation. They're one of the only primate species that is able to brachiate. Um, gibbons are the ones that are able to fully brachiate. And um, they have really, they have a fully, which is a really unique feature. So, like I mentioned earlier, focusing on New World primates has really allowed us to get to know their needs. Um, and that is a really integral part of what we do here at the sanctuary. We are all about custom care, individualized care. Um, we want to understand both species specific social systems, behavior and vocalizations, as well as learning to re recognize and respect individual differences. So um, our goal is to create an optimal natural and social environment for the well-being of the species and the individuals. We want every animal to be treated with respect, compassion and understanding. So when we do their housing, their social grouping, their nutrition, and their care, we do everything we can to um, facilitate their natural behaviors. So one of the first things that we do when we have new caregivers is we teach them the difference between the species. We talk about their social systems and groups. We talk about 
what their way of life is, what do they eat, how do they interact with their environment and with each other. And then we use that information to help create um, ideal enclosures for each species, as well as for each individual and to create appropriate diets and so, um, pairings and things like that. So you can see here just um, these three pictures, we have um, calotrichids. So calotrichids are able to cling vertically to tree branches. That's something that allows them to navigate in the wild. So we make sure that their enclosures have branches and things that they can cling vertically to and climb up and down. Capuchins are extractive foragers, so we give them branches that they're able to, you can see here they're tapping, trying to find insects in that branch. Spider monkeys brachiate, so we wanted to make sure that their environment allows them to brachiate. But beyond the, the science and that understanding, we really want to let the monkeys teach us, let each individual monkey tell us what their needs are. Um, they are our teachers. Um, they, we, we learn their behaviors, we learn their vocalizations, and then we tune in to each individual monkey. Um, we like to call it observing with child's eyes. You know how little kids, when they observe something, they're so present in the moment, they're so open to what's going on, they don't have those preconceived notions. We try to do that when we're around the animals so that they can tell us what their needs are. Um, if we're interested in pairing monkeys, we put them near each other and we watch their interactions. We don't just put two monkeys into the same enclosure and hope it goes well. We give them time to choose. Um, and we, we look at their backgrounds as well. Um, if, some, if an individual was an ex-pet, their behaviors and their vocalizations are going to be different. They may not have had the opportunity to learn from other monkeys. And so giving them the time to observe other monkeys, be around them, hear their vocalizations. Um, we had, you know, one monkey, his name is Pacey, and he, um, he was a pet. And when he first came, he was nearly silent. He didn't have many vocalizations. And now he has a pretty full repertoire. He's able to communicate with others. Um, and his, his interactions with his caregivers are unique. And we listen to that to try to find out what his needs are. And that goes through their whole life um, from when, they're, when they first arrive to all the way up until their passing. We, we do lifelong care and um, we really want to be able to do that to give them their needs. I, captive, captivity is, it's got lots of benefits to animals, of course. They're, they get good health care, they get their food provided, they don't have um, predators to worry about. But the one thing that is somewhat missing in a captive situation is autonomy and free will. In the wild, an animal, if they're, you know, growing up, they have the opportunity to leave their family group when it's time, when they reach sexual maturity, they have that opportunity to go off and find a new troop. Um, if they're not interested in another partner, they have the opportunity to not choose that partner. But in a captive situation, some of that is lost. Um, they don't, you, you know, there's great benefits, but they don't always have that choice. And I think that one of our goals as caretakers in a sanctuary setting is to give those animals back that free will, to give them that autonomy to the best of our ability. And we do that by listening to them, by letting them inform us of what their needs are, of if they are interested in having this partner, if they don't feel comfortable having that other monkey across from them. Okay, well, let's find a different location. Let's find what works for them. Um, some individuals have come from difficult backgrounds and they don't know how to interact with other monkeys. And that's very stressful for them. That's something we found with a lot of expats that they don't know how to interact with another monkey. And so forcing them to be in an enclosure with another monkey, they may not be ready for that. And their actions tell us that, and we're able to give them their needs as much as we can. And so it's, it's about that compassion, about that empathy, about tuning in, getting to know each individual so that we can give them 
the life that they want and treat them with honor and treat them with respect. And that goes all the way down until, you know, when they pass away and we do traditional Hawaiian burials and honor them and respect them and thank them for giving us the opportunity to care for them. Uh, one of the other ways that we are able to provide a really unique environment in our sanctuary in particular is through the environment. Um, we're located on the in the rainforest region on the north shore of Maui. Um, you can see here, this is what a lot of our, this is our capuchin enclosure. Here we have some marmosets in their enclosure. And um, it's lush, it's jungle, it's very similar. It's the only place in the United States that actually has a, a similar climate to the monkeys' native habitats in Central and South America. Um, so we're able to grow plants right here on site that are similar to what they would have in the wild. And um, we also are able to grow fresh fruits and fresh vegetables right here on site. We have um, passion fruit and guava and citrus and bananas uh, that all grow on site and we're able to provide that to the animals. One of the other, one of the ways that we kind of measure the impact of our work and say, hey, is this working, is through the um, the exceptional longevity of the animals in our care. So uh, marmosets and tamarinds, or marmosets anyways, the average lifespan is seven to nine years, but in captivity, um, you know, 15 to 17, uh, we have a 25 year old right now. And uh, many of the animals are between 18 to 24 years old. So that custom care, it's, it seems to be working. We're having animals with really long lives. And as animals age, um, that's really a challenge for caregivers. Young animals tend to not need a lot of medications, not need a lot of specialized diets. They can maneuver in their enclosures with ease. Um, but as animals age, that is not so much the case. They start to have higher incidence of chronic ailments. Um, I know, if any of you guys have worked with calotrichids, but in particular, they tend to have um, uh, sorry, colitis um, is a really common ailment among calotrichids. And so they really need customized diets. Um, they have longer recovery times and they need enclosures customized to um, meet their mobility issues. Cotton top chamarins tend to, to develop arthritis as they age. Um, that's a really common issue with them. And so they have a really hard time navigating a, a jungle environment with thin branches. So we do what we can to provide for those aging needs. And one of the things we do are we build these jungle walkways that you can see um, Elias is standing on right here. So this allows them to remain in an outdoor enclosure for a longer period of time. We put in stabilized branches as well so that it's not swinging as much. Um, and then we really customize their diets. We have, um, we work with our veterinarian very closely um, to provide the right medical care, supplements, um, diets. And uh, it's when they get to the point where they really have a hard time navigating, we create portable um, environments that are indoors completely enclosed and have ramps and walkways and then we'll put plants in there so they still have access to plants um, and we we do our enrichments to um, based on their needs as well the more agile animals will get more complex enrichment so everything is really customized we use um, behavioral conditioning as well to help with medical care um, getting them comfortable with entering catch crates and um, being hand caught, being groomed if they're elderly and have a hard time self-grooming or don't have a partner that grooms them well. Um, so those are all important parts of the caregiving that we do. One of the things that is also really unique about the sanctuary are our incorporation of Hawaiian values. So the sanctuary is located in Hawaii and indigenous people in Hawaii have a really long history of unique customs, practices, and beliefs. They had a authentic and compelling way of viewing the world. They believed that 
all things are connected to one another and to the source. Um, Hawaiians consider themselves to be stewards of the aina. The aina means the earth, this land, and they're responsible for caring for it and protecting it for their children. In the Hawaiian um, creation chant, the Kumulipo, man was actually the last to be created. And as such, it is man's responsibility to care for all the other creatures and beings that came before him. So since our inception, we've really embraced traditional Hawaiian values and made every effort to incorporate those values into our work. Um, when the sanctuary first opened our new facility, Hawaiian Kapuna or elders and other spiritual leaders came to bless the facility and a hula troop, Ikona Malima, um, honored the sanctuary by performing. One of the most common or well-known Hawaiian words is aloha. And aloha is, um, it's got really powerful and deep meanings. People think of it as, you know, oh, hello, goodbye, or love. Um, but really, aloha, on, on, a, on the surface, it means love, affection, compassion, mercy, and charity. But when broken down, it's actually a deeper meaning. Alo means the presence, and ha is the breath, the breath of life. And it's, it's the life energy. So aloha means the presence of the divine breath. So it actually has a spiritual context to it. And we really try to, we say, keep the aloha alive at the sanctuary. Aloha guides the way Hawaiians interact with one another, with the animals, the planet, the earth. It creates a feeling of mutual respect and compassion. And that's what we want to bring into our work every single day. It's not just a sanctuary for the animals. It's a sanctuary for everyone that comes to it. So all the caregivers as well, we want this sense of 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 compassion, of empathy, of love to infiltrate our work because that goes directly to the animals. So we treat them with love, respect, and kindness. Um, we are a volunteer-based organization, so everybody that's here is here out of the goodness of their own heart. They're here because they want to be here. So all of our caregivers, um, it's selfless service and it's healing to everyone, to the monkeys as well as their caregivers. Uh, Aloha nona holona means to have unconditional love, empathy, and compassion for all beings. Another way that we incorporate Hawaiian values is by caring for the land. Um, PPST members tend to the land. We grow fresh produce for the animals, for their enclosures, um, and that way we're able to share in the Earth's bounty. We believe that is our kuleana, or responsibility to care for the aina. And we really strive to minimize our impact on precious resources. We recycle as much as possible. Um, we try to be as ecologically friendly as we can. Um, the, the native environments of these animals are, of course, being destroyed at a rapid rate. The Amazon deforestation and, and all across the world, deforestation is happening. And so we really believe that caring for the land, caring for the animals, and treating all beings with honor and respect is vital to restoring the planet and returning it to a state of equilibrium. So it goes beyond what we do here at the sanctuary, which I love and I'm very passionate about, but it's about extending that to the whole world as much as possible. Um, and so we really share that mission with all of our volunteers and all of our supporters, um, as well as through our resident internship program. So uh, we have a great resident internship program. It is a one year long program and it is highly immersive. Um, we select students from primatology programs, biology programs, um, individuals that have you know, background in exotic animal care and they come for a year, they live on site and um, they are able to observe the animals of course in a, a naturalistic tropical setting and they learn um, all aspects of new world climate care. Like I said, it's a very immersive experience and the amount that is learned is, is very extensive in the year. Um, we've had 42 interns over the last 15 years and we're just continuing to expand that program. Um, over the course of the year, they're gonna receive training in 
all aspects of New World primate care. So in the beginning, they learn how to do the daily care, enrichment, and general nurturing to the animals. Then uh, in their next module, we call it, we have modules for training, they start to learn emergency care. And so they'll learn how to provide individual care to the animals, how to provide their medications, um, how to administer subcutaneous fluids, how to um, provide warmth and check temperatures and check vital signals. And they'll, they really help with our communicating with the vets and getting the information we need. After that, they actually start to learn about colony management and pairing of the animals. They help us to, we, we just recently did a pairing of two um, marmosets that had lost partners. And so they were able to make recommendations on which individuals could be together and monitor that progress make the determining factor, decide when to put the animals together, when to proceed and um, monitoring that and providing input to management on how they're doing. They also get to train new volunteers. Uh, they keep detailed medical records and write shift reports. And um, they also do an independent intern project as part of the internship. And in that they get to choose what it is that they want to delve deeper into and so they get to do research on that we've had um, a really wide variety of things it, some are real specific primate based um, some are broader we've had individuals do their projects on behavioral conditioning and helping us to create new documents on behavioral conditioning or pairing or um, how to be more eco-conscious, um, the specific medical needs of calotrichids or capuchins. And so in that, they're able to really ex expand their own knowledge and um, learn more about the species that they're caring for and the individuals that they're caring for and help us to make our manuals and materials even better. So we have very extensive manuals um, for all of our volunteers to review and they just continually get better and better and get more information because of the contributions of the interns. And interns, when they finish their, their year here at the sanctuary, they leave with a pretty extensive knowledge of New World Primate Care, um, calotrichids in particular, and they're able to also carry our mission and our values of empathy, compassion, and really custom care along with them. We've had um, several interns that have gone on actually to the CWU primatology um, masters and graduate programs. And we have some that have gone on to be veterinarians. Um, they're all over the world. We have, we've had interns from all over the world come and go on. And so that's a program that we're really um, proud of. And uh, the the sanctuary is we we believe that a small light can dispel a great darkness and we try to be a small light in the world we try to spread our light and share our message with all of all that we can to um, show that empathy and compassion are healing and that the animals are there are equals and they are you know worthy of being honored and respected and treated that way and we hope that that can help to you know in some small way shine a light and spread the message um, we really depend on compassionate supporters to you know like us on facebook and spread the word of what we're doing and to share about our internship program and to make donations and um you know, just kind of be a part of the sanctuary community. We're a, a small, a very small volunteer organization in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but we hope that our reach goes a lot further. And so I'm just honored to be able to share our work with you. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm truly passionate about it. Um, 13 years as a volunteer and it's my heart is is fully in it. And so thank you for letting me share. And I really Hope you guys will resonate with what we do and maybe some of you are interested in being interns or, you know, just joining our community on social media. So I really hope to see some of you there and um, yeah, open for questions now.
Thank you so much, Erin. That was awesome. Um, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask Erin, feel free to unmute yourself and ask her, or you could uh, type it in the chat and I'll make sure she gets your question. Aloha, Erin. Aloha, Clayton. <laughs> I was wondering with so many gumnivores like marmosets and tamarins that have a specific need for South American flora, were you able to import specific South American plants or plant them specifically so they could um, have those exudates? Unfortunately, no. Um, we do have plants that are very similar and um, they do, they are able to gouge their branches. But unfortunately, no, no exudates come of it. But we do make sure that their nutritional needs are met through, you know, the calotricid diet and things like that. But um, no, none of the trees that we have are actually gum producing. But we do make sure that they have lots of fresh branches and they do gouge quite regularly. It's actually really fun to watch. You'll see them gouging all their branches. And then, of course, they scent mark them. <laughs> so, great cotton top. <laughs> Thank you. Mahalo. Jessie would like to know, or she would like to confirm that the internship program is continuous and our internships offered every year. Yes, absolutely. So we have, um, we generally have three, two to three interns at a time. And um, we are, the way we're currently offering it is we have internships that start in mid-May, in August, and in January. We tried to get it so it kind of matches up with school. Um, calendars as well and yes it's ongoing we've been doing it for over 15 years i actually started as an intern that's how i came to the sanctuary so 13 years ago that was my start and i've been here ever since i'm going to ask one of my questions at this time um I was just curious if the majority of your supporter supporters are Hawaiian and do you think that is because of their values that they actually support the sanctuary more because of what you were talking about about the Hawaiian values? Um actually no, we have we have supporters from all over the world actually. Um I, I wouldn't say there's any one particular place where most of our supporters come from. I mean, obviously volunteers, the majority of our volunteers are local, um, but no, we have, we have supporters from all over and um, we're actually, because we're not open to the public, we keep, we keep ourselves a little bit quiet because um, we don't want people showing up and things like that. But I do think that the local volunteers really do resonate with the fact that we incorporate Hawaiian values. It's very common here in Hawaii. It's um, most organizations do try to incorporate Hawaiian values because it is such an integral part of the people and um, their culture. So it's, I wouldn't say, you know, we have supporters particularly for it, but I do think that many of our supporters really resonate with it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Raymond says, thank you for your presentation, Erin. Are researchers allowed at your sanctuary to conduct non-invasive research? Mahalo. Um, that is uh, another great question. Um, generally, no, that's not something that we do primarily because, like I said, we don't really um, want the animals to be distressed, even though non-invasive research, of course, is quite different and there is a lot of value to that, but it's just not something that we do at the sanctuary personally, um, mainly because of the background of a lot of the animals. They just have been through so much. Now, as part of their independent intern project, interns are able to do some um, observational studies if they want to as part of that, um, but it's, it's not something we really do. We have um, had people ask about research using like our data and materials, and that's something we would probably be open to, but not anything that actually comes where there's new people that are unknown at the sanctuary. 
Anita would like to know how many animals do you care for and what is the size of the sanctuary? Um, the sanctuary is uh, all together. I think we are on, we have a few acres all together. Um, we currently have a population of about 35 monkeys. Um, we've had larger populations in the past, but we found with the elderly animals, since most of the population is elderly, that um, the caregiving requires a lot more time and focus. And so currently a population of about 35, but we do have space for more animals potentially. Um, it is increasingly difficult to bring new animals into Hawaii. And so our real focus is the lifelong care of the current population and making sure that they are getting their needs met. Um, Ashton wants to know, uh, since outside researchers are not able to come to the sanctuary to conduct research, do any individuals outside of the interns, such as employees, conduct any research projects? If so, what type of research is being done? Um, nope, we're not doing any any research like that. It's really just providing them with a place of peace. We also don't actually have employees. We're an entirely volunteer organization. Um, Anna would like to know how has the pandemic affected the sanctuary? Has volunteer and intern presence been affected? Um, yes, definitely that has had an impact. Um, overall, it hasn't had too big of an impact because we already were following very strict health protocol. Marmosets and, well, all, all primates are highly susceptible to anything that humans carry. And marmosets and tamarins with their small size are particularly at risk. So even before the pandemic, every volunteer that came in called in a health check before they came. We didn't have anybody coming. If they have, you know, signs of illness, we would, you know, wear masks as needed and gloves. And um, so that is all the same. We have increased our health protocol with the pandemic so that masks are worn at all times by all team members. Um, and, you know, when caregivers arrive, they immediately disinfect their shoes and their hands before coming in. So the healthcare protocol has increased a little bit, but we already had pretty strong health protocol in place. Um, but volunteer and intern presence definitely has been affected. Um, volunteer presence actually, in some ways, it's we've had an increase because people were out of work and were able to come in more. Um, on the negative side, if anybody has come into contact with anyone with COVID or has any signs of illness, that's two weeks where they're out. Um, so that's had an impact. And then the internship has been, it's made it a little challenging um, particularly for interns from other countries, because getting a visa to come here has become pretty much impossible. Um, so in that way, it's had a negative impact. Some interns were able to come earlier because their projects were closed down and other interns have not been able to come due to travel restrictions due to, um, you know, health concerns and things like that. So it definitely has had an impact. It was harder for us to find interns for a little bit because, especially early on in the pandemic, but um, we do have, we are able to do quarantine in place for two weeks. And so we've been able to continue having the interns come and it's all worked out. Do you take um, short-term volunteers at all, or is it all like a long-term thing? It's pretty much all long term um, for the internship. It is definitely long term just because the uh, amount that is taught, it can't be done in a shorter term. And um, so we really want people to commit to that that whole time. As far as local volunteers, we generally request a year commitment from local volunteers if they want to be an animal caregiver and learn all of the um, tasks for vo local volunteers that are interested in being a support staff we can take a shorter commitment. Um, and we've also had, you know, people express interest in doing like an externship where they come and they don't live on site, but, you know, they find housing elsewhere and they want to dedicate, like, I can come for three months. So in that case, we're not able to provide housing 
upkeep for housing for, for those that can make the commitment. But we have had externs come and do, you know, like a three month and be um, be support to the sanctuary and learn. Great. Uh, Clayton would like to know, have you ever had proscenians at the sanctuary like lemurs? No, we haven't. Um, it's always been from the very beginning. It started as just uh, marmosets and tamarins. That was actually when it first began. And um, the directors, you know, decided that they wanted to stick to new world animals. So um, it's always just been new world monkeys and, you know, initially just the calatricids, but then there were um, some capuchins that had been brought to uh, another island and um, they wanted to put them in like a hotel as a tourist attraction kind of thing, but then um, they never got the right permits and they were locked away in small dog kennels and being fed bird food and somebody reached out to the director and said, you know, these these capuchins need a home. And so she said, well, I'm not going to turn that away. Um, they need they need help. So she, that's when kind of branched out to some other species. Um, we've stuck with uh, primate species that are compatible health wise. I know um, people have asked about squirrel monkeys, but squirrel monkeys do tend to carry hepatitis, which can be very, very dangerous to other species of primates. So um, we've mainly focused on the calatricids and then the capuchins and the spider monkeys as well were animals that were local that we knew needed a place and that we could provide for. So the spider monkeys were on a, a tourist attraction here on Maui for 20 years and kind of were, we waited a long time to be able to get them. We, you know, made contact with where they were and said, we can take them. And finally they were under new ownership and the new owner said, well, we don't want them. So we said, yep, we've got the space for them. We're ready. And so we uh, built them a 40 foot long enclosure that they could brachiate in and um, brought them in. And that was, it was really nice to see. Um, they had never been in an enclosure with any plants before. It was barren and, so seeing them, you know, move through, move through the greenery and break yay, it was, I mean, it made me cry. <laughs> it's, it's really beautiful. Um, I'm going to ask a question since I don't see any new ones. Um, what are, do you guys have any upcoming plans like a, like in the next year? How, how are you guys going to grow or in the five years? Um, I know you mentioned that it's really hard to get primates to Hawaii, but um, with how many there are in laboratories, like, do you guys know how many or like how you will be growing in the next couple of years? Um, you know, it's not, it's not a major focus for us right now. Um, we are always open to taking more animals and, you know, figuring out ways to get them here if, if someone says, hey, we've got this and will you take it and looking for that. But, you know, really our current focus is just on providing for the ones that we currently have and making sure that their life is the best that it can be. Sure. Cool. Does anybody have any more questions they would like to ask Aaron? All right, I don't see anyone with their hand up or asking um, any more questions. Um, what is the best way to follow the sanctuary? Is it just through your Facebook and Instagram? Yeah, so we have um, our Facebook page um, and our Instagram and uh, our website as well. Um, so any of those, and then um, you can also email us pps at pacificprimate.org, um, but definitely follow us on Facebook and I try to you know, share photos and videos of the animals. And if you're interested in the internship, I know that we had a couple internship questions. Absolutely send us an email and um, you know, it's, it's ongoing. So hopefully we'll see some of you in the future. And yeah, I really appreciate you guys listening and um, being able to share. 
course. Yeah, if in, if nobody else has any questions, then I will wrap it up. Um, that is, that concludes our day uh, or what or is it Tuesday? Wednesday? Wednesday. Um, and so tomorrow morning, please tune in at 930 for the start of African Apes. Um, thank you so much, Erin, for speaking with us today. Mahalo. Um, and if you have any more questions for Erin, I'm sure she will stay on for just a few more minutes. Yeah, definitely.